thank you for a wonderful opening session. Um, I really enjoyed it. And uh, hopefully some of what I will remark on will resonate with some of the presentations we already heard, though I'll be far from the world of NFTs in many ways. Uh, I'm going to let this image of the Philadelphia Museum of Art, uh, this iconic image, serve as a kind of reference as I began. Um, this is the museum I grew up with, and in many ways, it's the epitome of an analog museum. It's a very beautiful building on a wonderful site, and it also has a wonderful newly renovated architect design entrance, and it also contains incredible collections. It was completed around 1928. Um, but current technologies support practices that were, you know, impractical and basically impossible even a generation ago. And ways of working with objects and audiences, um, such as the kind of work that uh, Francis Little was describing, um, could not have been imagined when the Philadelphia Museum was completed in 1928. Now, these innovations um, suggest, among other things, that Maybe older models in which a work of art's value was linked to its uniqueness and even its authenticity uh, might become outmoded. For instance, if it's possible now, as it is, to make 3D printed replicas of the Parthenon friezes and return the originals to their homeland, is that an act of deception or a reasonable solution? And if an immersive experience allows the public to feel the weight of a royal crown, hold a scepter or a sword in hand, or even be imprisoned in medieval armor, does that trivialize the objects? Does it undercut their symbolic or actual value? Or does it extend it? Uh, we know that many ritual objects still need to be controlled by people who created them, again, within various communities. But providing access to a range of defined experiences means that once universal experiences can be nuanced for various stakeholders and communities. In addition, the creation of artificial environments combined with new AI-driven production of novel artworks, such as the use of GANs and other techniques, we'll come back to GANs, extends creative capacities to our machines and systems. So new objects, remarkable artifacts can be made using the texture of one thing, the shape of another, across all kinds of styles and periods and materials. So the very concept of originality no longer seems so very easy to define. And the question, do, do these innovations require rethinking the terms on which the authenticity of objects, provenance, materials, and experience, even perception, are defined? Will the power of immersive illusion increase to the point where these questions become irrelevant? Do these activities push the limits of illusion? or open a Pandora's box of delusion, in which we mistake the perception of a simulacrum for something real. Does that even matter? Or is the role of museums changing from the presentation of cultural materials to the production of experiences and situations? Or was that always the case? That experience, exploration, and knowledge was the goal of museum display. So in this talk, I want to explore some of the aesthetic, epistemic, and ethical issues that might be raised by these illusions or delusions within the museum world. My talk reaches no conclusions. It's just going to sketch some grounds for discussion. The Open Museum. A few years ago, in partial response to the emerging concept of the open museum, an idea that's linked to new modes of access and use of collections in online, virtual, and other modes, I wrote a piece titled The Museum Opens. Now, in that essay, I described a fantasy of digital and virtual features. Among the many details, the overarching premise was that the surface of display the building, exhibits, cases, everything, would serve as an interface to the vast inventory of networked cultural knowledge and artifacts. The virtual museum would be a portal to this networked universe of information and artifacts through a combination of screens, holograms, VR and AR experiences, and seamless points of access. Now, we know that a physical museum already offers many forms of interactivity. 
exchanges between didactic labels, objects and cases, some hands-on experience, and even storage rooms with pull-out shelves or drawers, the library, the archives, and other materials. They're interactive. What the virtual museum would be able to do is take full advantage of the networked environment to be able to call cultural knowledge into view through metadata, discovery, access, and so on, using computational tools of topic modeling, natural language processing, image recognition, and other advanced techniques. It would support dialogue, conversation, multiple points of perspective into the value and meaning of objects. So, what does the technological layer add to our longstanding experience? A change of kind or merely degree? So flashback for a moment to another era. My first immersive experience in a museum was with this giant heart at the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia. As children, we went with our school group on annual visits. We would dare each other to walk through the exhibit of this giant beating heart. Now, the model was a combination of theatrical carpentry, painted cloth, paper mache, and we followed the twisted path of blood moving from ventricle to oracle while a steady heartbeat pulsed around us. The walls had enough flexibility to vibrate with muscular conviction, and we were terrified. Every child taking their steps up the ramp and through the twisted passages felt a visceral claustrophobia moving through this immersive experience. We knew perfectly well that it was plaster and paint, rubberized materials and sound effects, but the effect was real. The sound was real. The movement of the walls was physical. For a period of time in which you were completely inside the heart enclosed by its beating walls, you were absorbed into the illusion. Now, this immersive experience left a deep imprint. Nothing else in my childhood experience of art or artifice was quite so multidimensional. Now, the design wasn't meant to trick the senses, but to make use of them, to intensify perception through stimulation of sight, sound, and embodied investigation. This was not an illusion, it was a thrill ride. And though I cannot say it left me with any real idea about the path of blood circulation through the heart. Now, would this experience be different if it were produced in a headset or in a cave environment? The irrefutable physicality of the giant heart had some features to it, but setting up a binary between authentic material and inauthentic virtual environments belies the fact that as humans, we understand the real in relation to the imaginary and the symbolic. We don't access reality in an unmediated manner, but through a combination of perception and projection. Our cognitive models filter our sensations. We construct our worlds rather than apprehend them. So though this doesn't collapse the distinction between virtual and physical worlds, it does mean that in evaluating the effects of each, we need to feel um, we need to consider the degree to which virtual and physical objects serve similar functions, which is to provoke engagement and response, despite their differences. When I handle a virtual object and feel its weight and form, does that create a significantly different experience than when touching its actual counterpart? Each are equally real in their capacity to provide and provoke experience. Can I learn the same things from them? Is the surrogate that is based on a data model already stripped of some of the variations and specificity of an actual object? It is. It only contains what's been put into the model. Is its formal existence in any sense reduced or generalized through the remediating activity as, of, of existing as data? For whom is that a significant issue? For a researcher, a school child, a member of the viewing public, future audiences. Old hierarchies of expertise can also be problematic in these instances. So let's consider a rich multi-sensory physical environment like that of the Natural History Museum in New York. And ask again, if we remove the hard and fast binarism between virtual and physical objects, what are the distinct qualities of exhibits rooted in artifacts and cases and those that are digital files on display. 
Perhaps we can begin by asking if there are any ethical issues in creating virtual illusions so complete that they are indistinguishable from actual or physical experiences. Is a physical model different from a virtual one? A visual exhibit case distinct from a display on a device? Why should we consider virtual stimuli any less authentic than physical ones? Is the authenticity of an object significant? Or does authenticity reside in the experience rather than the object? I feel the size of these whales. My body experiences the relative scale of their massive forms in relation to mind, my mind. Scale is a feature of physical space and embodied perception, but this too can be simulated. And also, it doesn't have to be for the experience to be authentic. So what are the benefits and liabilities of technologically produced, enhanced, and supported museum experiences? I harbor a deep skepticism <clears throat> about whether current innovation is conceptually transformative or merely an extension of existing practices, traditional practices. What really changes in thinking about art, artifice, nature, history, style, periodization, and other aspects of our human experience? Um, what, what changes are occurring as part of these innovations? Are we in fact delusional about how new these technological changes are, whether they're worth the expenditure of labor, resources, and time? So obviously no single answer is gonna address these questions and any single criteria for making ethical judgment would be too simplistic. So it's better to examine some specific cases and practices. So with all of that in mind, what I'm gonna do is kind of uh, create a really quick survey and inventory, which will be partial at best of museum practices and the contrast and continuities across more traditional and more technologically enhanced formats. Now, keep in mind, of course, that this morning and over the next few days, a whole array of projects will be presented in this conference many of which will have significant wow factors to them. The physical, the line between physical and virtual experience will be blurred by various more or less conspicuous technologies, headsets, view stations, game interfaces, other technologically complex devices, metadata contracts. As these projects are presented, let's consider how in each of these situations, we can ask what specific effects construct and structure our perception. So here I'm gonna introduce my own binary, which is a crucial one for me in assessing the value of aesthetic experiences. And this is the distinction between what are called directed and generative aesthetic experiences. Directed experiences have a program for viewing. These are generally didactic or overstructured and reductive. Generative ones provide an open-ended provocation that cannot be settled into a single experience or conclusion. Now, the binary is not a contrast between simple and complex objects, but between two very different modes of aesthetic expression. For instance, the path through the giant heart was highly directed and orchestrated. Even the physical movement through its passages um, you know, allowed no turning back. But in the Natural History Museum Hall, what you're seeing here, by contrast, I can move freely, wandering, making connections among and across objects at different scales, distances, and types, each offering a range of modes of encounter that play against each other, refracting individual objects through dialogue and exchange. And I'll come back to this binarism ahead. All right. So now I want to have, a, I'm going to give you a few very brief thoughts um, to provoke discussion across a range of exhibit practices. Um, so I'm going to move quickly through these to get some points and then leave some time for discussion. So I'm going to start with collection access. All right, so collection access is one of the most crucial aspects of museum work. And in, in this domain, the affordances of digital systems extend modes of display into ones of search and discovery, making it possible for users to follow their own interests and curiosity in a beneficial way. 
As online access has become integrated into research and teaching, many innovative interfaces are used to make use of visualizations to assist search and discovery, and some are more intuitive than others. For instance, this custom interface to the British Museum online collection is a graphical scheme that's organized by dates going into the back and coming forward to the present. Um, so dates and periods and geography, cultural locations. So a user can move through this grid and pick a defined node as a point of entry or an object. Now there's risks here, um, reifying complex regions into monolithic identities, Asia, excuse me, Europe, these are very complicated um, uh, you know, and heterogeneous um, areas. Uh, so those are risks, but the navigation's very quickly learned and the interface works. Now, by contrast, the rich collection of anthropological and archeological materials in the Pitt Rivers Museum, when we access it this way, moving through the cases has one kind of experience to it. But when we go to access it online through a search box, we find that only a few of the categories here, like keywords and classification, only a few categories offer a pull down menu of controlled vocabulary. So the classifications scheme is hidden from the user. I mean, who walks around with accession numbers to Pitt Rivers Museum objects in their head? Um, the classification scheme is hidden from the user who has to find objects through trial and error. I found this extremely frustrating. Um, without a way to browse and follow trails of associated objects, the interface is challenging, even if this kind of search box, is, uh, search box structure is familiar. So why not expose the knowledge organization in the classification scheme as an interface? A final contrast for collection access is offered by open storage, such as this in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, where discovery and display support each other. Why not link this kind of visual access to physical objects with the metadata backend? to expose the intellectual arguments structured into the museum's inventory. It could do this with AR um, or even a QR code. Now, another museum practice, crucial museum practice is audience engagement. And this has been um, now uh, much enhanced through gamification. So finding ways to engage a diverse audience of viewers can be challenging and gamification uh, of the experience is one approach. So the British Museum used Minecraft. Um, exhibit designers are taking advantage of the motivation that gets built into games, their ability to produce absorption into tasks and attention through the use of goals and rewards, such as pings and lights, advancement through levels, satisfaction, seeing one's activity register with a score attached to it. All of this can be turned to good use for encounters with cultural objects especially if you're a gamer, which it so happens I am not. But now here the British Museum has made um, a Minecraft environment stocked with ancient Egyptian materials. Who doesn't thrill to the possibilities of discovering a, a tomb full of mummies? At the National Children's Museum, as we can see, plenty of games exist in analog environments as well, whether you're supporting this, um, you know, sphere on a column of air or getting ready to launch um, little truck uh, wheeled vehicles. Um, and though, though largely aimed at children, these kinds of interactive um, activities take advantage of physical activities to engage the intellectual imagination. Now, audience engagement can be supported through other kinds of exercises. Um, I'm struck, by the way, at how similar these two portraits are, formally speaking, um, uh, Rembrandt on the left and Dali on the right. When I was teaching in New York City, I took students to the Metropolitan Museum of Art quite frequently. But my Columbia University students were bored. They're bored, they, they just like weren't interested. Their eyes glazed over as we walked through gallery after gallery. So desperate to find a way to engage them with the materials, I suggested that they imagine that their parents would supply funds for them to hire any artist from the history of art to paint their portraits, but that they had to justify the choice through discussion of the appropriateness of the artist's style to their individual identity. 
So then they went through the museum with eager open eyes, identifying with each of the images in turn as they imagined themselves painted by a long dead master. So here, again, it's a psychological issue. It's the narcissism of identification that allows engagement with the works, no technology required. So all of these approaches um, open collections to experience uh, experiences of curiosity and discovery across the virtual and analog spectrum. Now, automation and uh, encounters with uh, bot type creatures is going to be increasingly a part of our futures. And as AI systems become increasingly sophisticated, interactions with robotic um, and uh, synthetic interlocutors is increasing. The affective dimensions of such interactions are linked to the thrill of the uncanny, to watching the almost human automaton, and the historical fascination with these automata continues into the present as interactive systems get smarter and smarter. The last few weeks, my colleagues are all playing with the new GPT-3 bot, um, the language generators, and they're finding it very compelling to have an exchange with an entity whose knowledge base is encyclopedic um, and with well-developed natural language skills. Now, the mechanized repetitive actions of early automata, such as the uh, writer writing uh, machine on the left who drew and wrote, um, are set to explode in the future into the highly articulate robot interlocutors, such as this little critter with the glowing eyes on the right. Um, and we can imagine this uh, fellow taking you by the hand um, in a satisfying docent role, just as robotic pets are fulfilling their domestic role as companions to many people. Um, affect matters in making these systems succeed. So again, how does the affective dimension of these uh, systems work within a museum setting to get uh, people actively engaged and involved? Now, animation is another uh, uh, current um, sort of device being used in uh, online museum displays in particular. Now, animation, as we know, exists in analog works as per these particular novelties from the 19th century. These were produced at a moment when creating the illusion of movement was itself a radical innovation. But unless motion is an integral part of the conception of a project, it can detract rather than augment the work. So in this case, for instance, this is, I'm not showing the uh, video of the automation animation because it's really, really annoying. Um, and this has been part of a recent trend to enliven static works of art of the past through animation, as if this is not dynamic enough. So here we have Bruegel 1652, the fall of the rebel angels. Um, and um, uh, in this online example, the designers isolated individual figures like this central figure, turning them into cardboard cutouts, and it makes them wave their swords as they struggle in battle. This is profoundly counterproductive aesthetically and intellectually, in my opinion. In Bruegel's work, good and evil are intertwined in a complex struggle that's demonstrated here by their visual entanglements. And the animation that cuts these figures out reduces the sophisticated conception in the painting to a trivial puppet show. Navigation is another uh, crucial feature of museum work and exhibit designers are always thinking this through in analog space, making use of multiple features to create a narrative for viewers. They consider the space, eye lines, labels, case layouts, scale, and so forth. This organizes and directs experience, but in an analog space, this can be a very this can have a very meditative quality, providing a narrative that can be engaged or ignored as a script for the user experience. Now, navigation in things like the Google Street View used to record museum spaces, um, which is frequently used, um, permits an online viewer to move through a collection in a 3D model created with photogrammetry or other capture. Now, this has obvious advantages. It allows a version of an exhibit, um, organization, museum, and layout narrative to be experienced online. 
but it comes at a weird cost, um, which is that all of these disorienting angles, tilts, distortions occur as you move through. Um, and there's also this very weird isolation. You're, you're always in an unoccupied space. There's no other viewers present. The point of view built into Google Street View is mechanical and the disconnect between the visual mapping and the embodied inhabitation of space is for me very disorienting and disturbing. The technical work of the navigation system overwhelms, it, overwhelms experience of objects and I'm always aware of the space. I feel like the space is what's getting attention here um, rather than uh, being offered the embodied relationship to looking at objects. Now, another new uh, trend um, has been to increase the possibilities of tactile experience. Now, typically, traditionally, museum collections are not available to be touched. I mean, you know, there's the rare hands-on experiences. So providing an opportunity to touch virtual objects is profound. It has all kinds of teaching and research implications, as well as exhibit value. In addition, these approaches provide unqualified benefit when providing tactile experience for the blind or visually impaired individuals. And the introduction of physical rather than verbal surrogates makes a dramatic difference in the information that's being communicated about an object. But again, some of these techniques work better in certain situations than they do in others. I don't know if you're familiar with this exhibit. Uh, it was created at Alto University, and it allows the viewer to enter into this Rembrandt painting, the anatomy lesson of Dr. Nicholas Tulp. Now, enormous amounts of work went into this, right, to produce digital surrogates. Models had to be costumed and photographed and po posed um, to replicate ap actions. But all of the subtle complexities of the painting, the combination of multiple gazes, the role of the textbook down here at the corpse's feet in the shadows, the play of light to orchestrate the presentation of medical practices and knowledge in a social space, the individual portraits, all of this becomes literalized and reduced to a single spectacle, a theatrical moment. And the I mean, it's, it's just weird, right? The model for creating the visual space itself was a 1691 anatomical theater that was built long after Rembrandt's death, raising some ethical issues here. But finally, and this is the weirdest of all, the viewer is placed in the position of the corpse about to be subject to the attentions of these men. Now, I find this creepy and spectacularizing, though others may differ. Okay, simulation and illusion, again, standard within traditional museum practices, especially in natural history. Um, the capacity for visual illusion has long played an essential role in both art making and museum displays. The magnificent panoramas of the past were produced by artists, though only a handful were of the caliber of James Perry Wilson, shown here, whose work fortunately is still being preserved in a few mu museums, so this work is going um, out of style and often being retired. Um, here we have our uh, uh, bear bears in their mountain setting. Um, so again, these spectacular illusions. Um, but virtual and augmented reality techniques also extend these illusions in the service of imaginary encounters with lost worlds, extinct beasts, and possible worlds, as in the case of these AR dinosaurs. Now, the outcome here is really wonderfully playful and engaged when I engaging. I, I encourage you to look at these dinosaurs. I mean, who doesn't want to dance with dinosaurs? You see children doing it in this video. The difference between this and the Dr. Tulp situation, I think, is profound. The technology makes it possible to have an experience of an otherwise inaccessible world. And it's not being used to rework a masterpiece, animate it in some kind of reductive way, but to create a credible illusion um, for purposes of study and engagement. And this raises all kinds of provocative questions about motion, scale, coloration, and so forth in our model of dinosaurs. Now, the creation of copies has also been a longstanding feature of art study and collection, and new methods of information capture, capture combined with 3D printing makes replicas of valuable works more and more common. But the plaster casts here in the Victorian Albert Cast Court are fully identifiable as copies, and they're identified that way, their provenance is clear. 
but they bear enough resemblance to their originals to provide study objects, not only of their originals, and this is a crucial point, but of the features that seemed significant in those originals at the time the copies were made. Not all plaster casts of Michelangelo's David are precise replicas, especially when they were produced by human hands, even using calipers and other me measuring devices. Copies, like forgeries, age somewhat differently from their sources, and they thus provide an insight for us into the historicity and cultural specificity of vision, as well as art and collecting practices. Recent and compelling debates about repatriation have motivated the return of artifacts to their original sites. And this is currently prompting discussion about the possibilities that copies of these works be kept as substitutes. Now, as long as the provenance and processes are well documented, is there an ethical issue here in creating copies like this of the Parthenon marbles? Control of intellectual and symbolic property should reside in the communities from which these materials are derived and surrogates have to be made with respect and negotiated agreements. But can these be used to extend appreciation across cultures? Do these surrogates add or diminish the value of the originals? And is it important to be able to tell the difference between the copy and the original? Or can we imagine an authentic experience produced by a simulation? So, Coming towards the end here, let's think about some overarching issues, such as illusion, trompe l'oeil. One of the ways in which illusion was tested in realistic works was always through touch. So the tactile became the authenticating gesture. In the classic tale, Pliny the Elder describes a contest between two painters, Zoixis and Parasius, to see whose skills of imitation were the best. Zoixis' fruit and flowers seemed so real, a bird swooped towards them, and the contest seemed decided. But the judge reached to pull back what he believed was a curtain in front of Parasius's painting, and the prize had to be conferred on the second painter. So is it important to be able to distinguish levels of illusion? Does reinforcing illusion by coordinating multiple sensory inputs carry a risk or a benefit? And at what point does an illusion become a deception? Or is this merely a matter of the purpose to which something is put? When the curtain is pulled back in a museum showing its contents, its storage, its shelves, its organization and metadata to provide access, does this provide another illusion? That of openness in a situation that's not really participatory, but merely an extension of control, display, hegemony, ownership, and so on. Is Charles Wilson Peale really offering a critical view into a knowledge system with all its cultural imprints and historical formation, inviting exploration, discovery, and critical engagement, or just showing off his collections? Still, it's tempting to imagine entering that room to see uh, what's on those shelves and how they're organized. The open museum contact concept extends experience beyond institutional walls as well into encounters with the larger world. And AR systems allow information to be layered in non-invasive ways, such as this Viking mound, offering an experience of the world without interfering with its condition, allowing for research, appreciation, and conservation all to proceed simultaneously. Without question, this is an augmentation, a benefit, and not a reductive trivialization. In the final cost-benefit analysis of the use of technological innovation, then, I'd suggest that the issues are not whether AR, VR, or online and digital surrogates are illusions in a different sense than their analog counterparts. Each modality has its strengths, and some projects are well-conceived and others ill-conceived, and that's true in every mode. But we don't need to consider, but don't we also need, and here I'm showing you a Gans uh, generated modern work of art, and you can sort of see what it's drawing on in terms of various uh, canonical figures. But as we think about these technological innovations, don't we really need to consider the ecological and environmental costs that are involved in creating digital and virtual projects, as well as the human labor and time? These projects are very expensive to maintain, to sustain. Also, they tend to look out of date very quickly and you know, they require considerable cost. 
So the question that seems worth asking in every case is not whether or not um, uh, what is added through this investment actually extends experience, provokes or generates engagement, or whether it, um, oh, uh, the question that does seem work, worth asking in every case is whether or not what is added actually extends experience, provokes and generates engagement, or whether it trivializes and reduces cultural materials to a single reading or a directed experience. The challenge in any museum environment, uh, physical or virtual, is to, to design experiences that are not limited to a programmatic approach, not constrained by didactic or overscripted frameworks, but provocative and generative. As to the authenticity of artifacts and objects, does it matter if dinosaurs are virtual? Or if a few mermaid skeletons like this one end up in our collections, obviously this is not a digital mermaid skeleton, but a real one. How is this different, this skeleton, from a GAN's produced work with its feature mashup? I was just showing you a moment ago. I would suggest for the sake of polemic that both are fully authentic, authentic products of human imagination and discovery. The difference is that in a surrogate, virtual or digital product, the only information present is what was in the model. Photogrammetry is a visual system. It picks up the features it is trained to see like any other optical and visual processor. In the realm of physical experience, we're exposed to information we can't process already with the capacity to generate unexpected provocations in response. And this remains a crucial difference between modes, among modes, and their very ontological status, as well as the epistemologies they express and support. I think we're smart enough to play with illusions, to be provoked into thinking about what it is we think we're seeing, until we cross the science fiction line in which illusions begin to have real agency. But for now, the range of play, riding the thin line between illusion and delusion, between the actual and the virtual, seems likely to extend and expand. The value of museum spaces can also be that they provide a sensory deprivation experience in which our focus is sustained because of the elimination of surplus distraction. Will the promise of the virtual world only be fulfilled when it becomes indistinguishable from any other perception and sensation? If so, who will guide and drive that vision? Again, will it be commercial interests, the entertainment industry, hucksters who think pro providing a chance to shake hands with Salvador Dali will generate profits? Or will it be a paleontologist modeling an extinct species through gauging weight and mass of bones in different models? A teacher letting children perform bloodletting rituals in a virtual space, good idea. What happens when the technological imaginary with its host of simulated sensations and conventions comes to organize my expectations of the analog world as well? And perhaps this is the right place to end with a cautionary tale about the 19th century British art critic, John Ruskin. His knowledge of Greek sculpture had not prepared him for the sight of the nude body of his new wife on their wedding night and the ways in which it differed from the ideals of pure white marble and smooth classical forms, the marriage failed. Will there be a moment when the physical world disappoints us and disgusts us with its visceral realities? I want to preserve my ability to be absorbed in and navigate the analog world as well as the virtual one, to keep my stimulus thresholds within a range that does not require special effects as a constant accompaniment. I dread entering a museum that feels like a video arcade in which the capacity to imagine, conceive, and identify is completely entangled with technological tropes and gaming mechanisms that structure my experience through tightly scripted programmatic agendas. But do I want to have dinner among the Neanderthals, be immersed in a Japanese court, or wander through old worms' cabinets, or handle the chisels and brushes of a vanished artist? Of course. <laughs>